Hey guys, welcome back to another taxonomy video. In this video, we're going to look at arthropods and echinoderms. So phylum arthropoda and phylum echinodermata. So let's first take a look at arthropods. This is phylum 8 out of 10 that we're going to look at, and this is a big phylum. In fact, arthropoda is the largest animal phylum in kingdom animalia. So it includes insects, spiders, and crustaceans. So there's three groups that we're going to look at. So as we've gone through these various phyla, they've been getting more complex. So arthropods are very complex. They're triploblastic, meaning that they have an ecto, meso, and endoderm. They're coelomates, they have a true coelom. And because they're coelomates, we have to worry about the blastopore, whether it's the mouth first or the anus first. And theirs is the mouth first, meaning that they are a protosome. And because they are triploblastic, it makes sense that they have bilateral symmetry in their body plans with cephalization. So they have a collection of nervous tissue to make up a head and a brain. It also makes sense that they have the most advanced type of digestive system, which is a complete one-way digestive tract where food goes from the mouth to the anus. What's unique about arthropods is their excretory system. They have a malpigian tubule system. There's two things that the malpigian tubule system does. Number one is excretion of nitrogenous byproduct or waste. So in arthropods, the nitrogenous waste is uric acid. The second thing that it does is secrete fluid into the alimentary canal, into the digestive tract. And this fluid is reabsorbed and certain substances are then transported into the circulatory system. Speaking of their circulatory system, the fluid is known as hemolymph. So in our bodies, for example, we're vertebrates and we have two fluids, and that is blood and lymph, so the lymphatic system. Um, arthropods don't have those two systems, they just have one, and that's the circulatory system, but hemolymph fulfills both of those functions of blood and lymph. And hemolymph is also blue instead of red once oxygen is bound to it, hence why I colored it blue instead of red. The last thing about arthropods that we need to know is their advanced respiratory systems. And this depends on what type of environment they're found in. So aquatic arthropods like crustaceans are going to have book gills, spiders are going to have book lungs, and terrestrial arthropods are going to have tracheal tubes. What are some other key features of arthropods? Well, number one, they have jointed appendages. So they have joints found in their legs. They also have a chitin exoskeleton. Where else have we seen the molecule chitin found in other animals? It's found in kingdom fungi. Now remember, fungi has chitin found within their cell walls. We looked at nematodes that undergo ectasis. That's the process of molting. Arthropods also undergo ectasis. That's the process of shedding their exoskeleton and making a new, larger one. Another unique characteristic of arthropods is going to be their specialized segments of their body plan known as tagmata. So they have a head tagmata, a thorax tagmata, and abdominal tagmata. However, in spiders and crustaceans, the head and thorax tagmata are fused together, and that's called the cephalothorax. So in other words, their head is found on their thoracic region. And then the last key characteristic of an arthropod is how it's born. So arthropods can either be born as a nymph or a larva. Nymphs are just smaller versions of the larger adult form whereas larvae undergo metamorphosis in a pupa to change their body plans. So think of a butterfly, for example, here. And then an example of a nymph would be a cricket or a grasshopper. Okay, let's take a look at the specific groups of arthropods and what makes them unique. So the first group is insecta, insects. This is the largest number of species within the group arthropoda. They have six jointed legs. All other types of arthropods are going to have eight or more. You should definitely know what each group has for their respiratory system. So for insects, they have spiracles, and those are openings on their exoskeleton where air can enter and exit, and they have tracheal tubes for respiration. So an insect uses tracheal tubes in tandem with spiracles to directly deliver oxygen into their tissues. One way to learn information is to associate it with a fear. It has a strong cognitive synapse, so you're never going to forget it. So I have a fear of insects crawling down my trachea. And I have a trachea that's part of the respiratory system. So insects, trachea, tracheal tubes, that's what they use for respiration. And then one last thing about insects, they have one pair of antennae. 
The next type of arthropod that we need to know are going to be the crustaceans. So lobsters, crabs, shrimp, and crayfish are examples of crustaceans. They have book gills for respiration. They're called book gills because they look like a book. Makes sense, right? They have these flap-like appendages that are used for gas exchange. And one unique thing about crustaceans is the cephalothorax. Remember, that's the fusion of the cephalic region, so the head tagmata, and the thorax tagmata together combined into one. So their head is on their thorax. Now for excretion, they also have malpigian tubules because they are arthropods. They also have green glands sometimes, which are also called antennal glands because they're located at the base of the antennae. So they have two pairs of antennae, whereas insects only have one. Okay, the last group of arthropods we're going to look at are going to be the arachnids. So this is spiders and scorpions and ticks. They have eight legs. They also have book lungs for gas exchange, not to be confused with book gills. However, they're similar in appearance to book gills because they have um, that appearance of having a book because they have those flap-like projections. The way I remember the difference is spiders have book lungs because they're terrestrial, whereas crustaceans are aquatic, so they need gills. They need book gills. Arachnids also have the cephalothorax, the fusion of the two tagmata, the head and the thorax tagmata. They have no antennae, unlike crustaceans that have two pairs of antennae and insects that have one pair of antennae. All right, guys, the last phylum we're going to look at for this video is going to be echinoderms. So phylum number nine, echinodermata. Echinoderms are very unique and they share many key characteristics to phylum chordata, which is the phylum that we're under. So they're triploblastic, they have three germ layers, they're coelomates, but they are deuterostomes, not protostomes. What does that mean? That means their anus forms first from the blastopore. The hallmark key example of an echinoderm will be a starfish. So just memorize that echinoderms are a starfish. Now they're triploblastic and most triploblastic animals, almost all triploblastic animals, have bilateral symmetry in their body plans. Echinoderms are the exception. They express radial symmetry as adults. So again, radial symmetry is symmetry around a central point or axis. So just picture a starfish. Now, because they're not bilaterally symmetrical, they don't have cephalization or a brain, but they do have a complex nervous system known as the central nerve ring with radial nerves expressing that radial symmetry. Now, I stated that radial symmetry exists as adults, but when they're in the larval form, they have bilateral symmetry. So echinoderms are really unique. They're a deuterostome. This is the first phylum so far again. Chordates are also deuterostomes. They have radial symmetry as adults, but they have bilateral symmetry during their larval stage of development. Now they also have a mouth and an anus, so they have a complete one-way digestive system. And there's no vessels involved in their circulatory system, so they have an open circulatory system where blood can flow throughout the tissues. Then lastly, many types of reproduction here. You have asexual reproduction done by fragmentation, where you're breaking off a piece of the starfish that's regenerating into a new organism. You also have sexual reproduction by external fertilization or the release of gametes into the external environment that fuse together to make a new offspring. Lastly, there's a few key characteristics of echinoderms. Number one is the water vascular system. This is the hydraulic system that's used for the transportation of nutrients and waste and respiration and is completely unique to echinoderms. Second thing you should know is the podocyte these are the cells that are responsible for the filtration of bodily fluids in echinoderms. And lastly, just to hit this point home again, they have radial symmetry even though they're triploblastic, but they have bilateral symmetry during their larval stage of development.